Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, first of all, I would like to have a special thank you to Eduardo and Ralph for giving us such a great outline of the requirements under the GDPR for cross-border data transfers, as well as the requirements um, under SHREPS 2 and the outline of the new SECs. And now my role is to walk you through my experience and some practical steps to actually ensure compliance with those requirements. Um, to set the scene, uh, sorry. Uh, to set the scene, I would actually start with a, key, a few key takeaways that I have from managing uh, transfers of personal data from EU to Hong Kong and actually across the world. So from my perspective, ensuring compliance with the GDPR requirements on cross-border transfer starts with the basic understanding of what does it mean to ensure the continuity of the protection. So how do we actually ensure that when we move the data to Hong Kong, the protection granted by the EU law also follows that data? And this starts with the idea that actually this is not a tick the box exercise. There is this common misconception that when that it's pretty much sufficient to sign your standard contractual clauses and say, okay, the matter is closed, we are compliant with, with the requirements for cross-border data transfers. But in fact, uh, the right to privacy is a right with an active na nature. It means that both data exporters as well as data import importers continuously have to put effort to ensure the to ensure the compliance with the requirements and also to ensure that the personal data is protected by introducing legal organization and technical measures of protection in a manner. And, and then it's also uh, for you as a data exporter, you need to make sure that your data importers are handling the data in a manner which is aligned with the GDPR. And uh, fortunately and very helpfully, the European Data Protection Board has introduced a recommendations around this supplementary measures. Uh, for SHREMS 2, and they introduce a six steps roadmap uh, of compliance. And I would give you some practical examples of how you can incorporate this within your privacy management framework. Because actually, um, the easiest way of, or the less hard way of achieving compliance with, uh, with the requirements for cross border data transfers is to incorporate them in your overall privacy management framework, make them an integral part of your privacy management framework. The SECs do not operate in vacuum. They, they need to be, when you implement them and when you implement the supplementary measures, you need to think of them in the context of your data registry, of the context of your privacy impact assessments, as well even in the context of your internal audit activities. So you can have this uh, continuous um, assurance that actually you're compliant with the requirements for cross-border data transfers. Just to start, um, I would introduce you to two basic concepts. Uh, one is what is the data transfer actually? What does it constitute? And the other one is which parties are data importers? And there is this common misconception that actually if you collect personal data from individuals within the EU that is constitutes data transfers. Actually, this actually this only constitutes collection, which may result in you being subject to the GDPR if you meet the requirements are, uh, for the territorial scope of GDPR under Article Three. Um, however, the definition of, of, of transferring of personal data includes sending the personal data or making it accessible, and I would underline this to a receiver located in a country outside of the EU where the receiver is actually legally distinct from the organization as a separate company, uh, organization, or individual. And this has a, a few very important implications. So um, first thing is that, as I mentioned, I would underline making it accessible. That means that you don't necessarily need to take the data outside of the EU and put it in a data warehouse somewhere within Hong Kong for this to be considered a transfer. Even providing access to the data and making it able for another company in Hong Kong to access the information of individuals within the EU is sufficient grounds for you to be considered that you're transferring this personal data and for you to have to comply with those requirements. And this is especially important when you're sharing personal data uh, to another organization as part of your corporate group. Um, so if you have a, a, a company within Europe where the data is stored and, and you're using a shared drive to um, provide access to information to another group company within Hong Kong, that would actually constitute a transfer of personal data. Um, however, just 
be aware that if you're sharing it with someone employed by your own company or organization, this doesn't constitute restricted transfer. So it has to be a separate legal entity within your corporate group for this to be considered a transfer. A couple of other very standard examples is um, sharing personal data with a cloud service provider. So uploading it to the cloud in a different location. Also sharing personal data with another strategic partner situated here in, in, in Hong Kong. And while talking about data importers, as I mentioned, it needs to be a separate legal entity, organization, or individuals. And there are two key roles there we need to think about. Um, and those are very basic privacy concepts. And I know that most of you are quite experienced, but it is very important to be able to distinguish when your data importer acts as a data processor and acts as a data controller, just because this would also uh, define uh, which module of the standard contractual clauses you're going to be using or modules based on the docking clause as well. Um, this and, and actually in some more uh, complex transactions, it's not that straightforward to identify who is the controller and processor, but it is something that is also required under the appendix of the SEC. It has an explanatory note and there it's really, um, it, it is stipulated that it is important to very clearly outline which are the different actors as part of the as part of the different data transfers subject to the FCCs. So it is really important to be mindful of, of whether your data importer acts as a data processor, so processing the data on your behalf, or they act as a separate data controller, so using it for their own purposes, like business partners. And, and, and typical, typical example of data controllers would be other business partners for, from with whom you share personal data. And data processors would be your suppliers or vendors which handle personal data for you. So um, now that we set this aside, let's talk about some practical steps of, of ensuring compliance. Uh, I think the very, very first and most basic steps, and both Edward and Ralph mentioned about it, is know your data. This is a basic um, requirement for pretty much all of the data protection compliance efforts, but it's even more important when it comes to personal data transfers. Um, you, you need to know where your what and where your personal data is transferred in order to know actually what requirements you need to put in place, whether this you're transferring your data to a country with an adequacy decision where you don't need to put any additional um, any additional measures or you need to use the SCCs or even to do your third country assessment, impact assessment, you would need to know where your personal data is, is shared. The second point is integrate your privacy impact assessment as part of your data transfer processes. Just because as I mentioned, um, data privacy compliance and especially compliance with the rules for international data transfers is a forward-looking exercise. By implementing a robust data registry, you would know what your data transfers are currently. Um, it's a snapshot of your current data transfer framework. And you would know in which places you may, you may have to remediate certain, certain transfers. For example, introduce the new standard contractual clauses or introduce any supplementary measures depends on the case. However, you also need to make sure that in the future, any new transfers are going to be covered by the requirements and you're not going to start transferring personal data outside of the EU without actually um, having gone through the relevant assessment, uh, having re reviewed the relevant measures and so on. And finally, the last step is ongoing monitoring because the principle of, of accountability, which is one of the underlying principles under the GDPR, but also many other privacy laws around the world, says that you have to be vigilant around uh, privacy compliance. So meaning that both parties needs to ensure an ongoing compliance and make sure that um, the same level of protection is, is constantly being uh, provided to the personal data. So that sounds like a lot of work and actually it is. However, um, if you put this initial efforts around uh, setting up your, uh, your data registry, setting up your privacy impact assessment framework, this would be a great way to show your compliance with, with the accountability principles. So let's zoom in the data registry. Again, as most of um, data importers would, uh, data exporters would already be subject to the GDPR, you would have already a GDPR compliant data registry. Um, if you're a data importer and you don't have still, you're not subject to a legal framework which requires you to have a data registry, uh, just note that um, 
actually the SCCs, the different modules of the SCCs would have the documentation and compliance clauses, which means that you would be required to have to keep appropriate documentation of the processing activities carried, uh, carried out under your responsibility. And record of processing activities is one of the best ways to do so. So by, by putting together a record of processing activities, you would have a very detailed map of what personal data you have, how is it collected, where is it stored, very important for data transfers, uh, which are the access involved? What are actors involved? What are the categories of personal data? What are the purposes of processing? Uh, who has access? Uh, what is the location and storage? Um, and this is very, very helpful when it comes for, for a few things. First and foremost, um, it is when you're actually completing your uh, standard contractual clauses because companies which have little experience with dealing with the standard contractual clauses would think that it's a very easy exercise. You already have the template provided by the European Commission and there is not much work to be done around it. However, um, as Ralph mentioned, actually Annex 1, 2, and 3 to the standard contractual clauses require quite a lot of input from the parties. You have to be able in a lot of detail, sufficient detail to distinguish the different transfers under the relationship. You would have to be able to list things like what categories of personal data are transferred to which locations. Is this a regular transfer? Do you have sensitive personal data? describe the nature of the processing, the purpose of the transfer. So this is an information that would be very hard and it would be a very complex task if you have to do it from the get-go when you're signing the clauses. It's so much easier if you have this information readily available in your data registry and you just complete it or in the standard contractual clauses. It is also helpful, of course, it is essential to carry out your um, data transfer impact assessment, your third country impact assessment to know where are you actually sending your personal data. So this starts with understanding what your data flow is. And again, the data registry would be very helpful on, on that account. And finally, of course, it is a great way to record your supplemental measures, your technical and administrative measures, and have everything in one place to really have this solid proof of your accountability requirements. Um, and the next step is actually um, to think going forward. As I mentioned, not only that you have to currently achieve compliance and have all of your current transfers compliance, set up your new standard contractual clauses by December next year, but you also have to be forward thinking and you have to put in place controls where you make sure that um, your ongoing transfers are not going to be executed before you actually do the necessary checks. And that's where the, the privacy impact assessment is very, very helpful. Um, because if you set up a privacy impact assessment process as a requirement before actually any, before starting or in the very initial stage of any project which involves the use of personal data, you would be able to in the very beginning identify which are the, the jurisdictions, which are, uh, what is your data flow, and then identify if there is a potential data transfer. You cannot depend on your business uh, and your IT departments even to know every time that a certain transaction or a certain data share would constitute in a, in a transport or data transfer. They would not, for example, when they're engaging um, at a, a third party a, a data analytics provider, which is a cloud service provider, they may not know that sharing this personal data to the cloud is potentially going to result in, in transfers of personal data. So this is why it is very helpful to set up the privacy impact assessment as an advisory tool in the very beginning of, of, of a new project. So you can easily identify when you have an international data transfer, map the data flow, flow which would help you assess um, will help you identify which country you're sharing the personal data with and do your third party assessment. It would also help you uh, have already readily available the information you would have to input in the, in the annexes of the standard contractual clauses. It would also help you identify the necessary technical and security measures, which you need to add in Annex 2 of the standard contractual clauses, as well as any supplementary measures as well. So it is a very, very helpful tool. And it is very helpful to, to have everything in one place. And, and if ever you have to share with the regulatory authority or, what, or prove your compliance with the requirements for cross-border data transfers, having everything in one place in a systematic manner would be very, very helpful. 
And talking about this, I did mention that from my perspective, it is really helpful to incorporate the third country impact assessment within your privacy impact assessment. And this is really because uh, this is really because, again, you have everything systematic in one place, but also taking into account that actually um, the third country assessment, although specific to a country, you also have to take into account the, the specifics of the data transfer. So the outcome may be different when it comes to deciding on supplementary measures. If depending on the types of personal data that you're planning to share, for example, if you're sharing special categories of personal data or transferring special categories of personal data. So, and talking about the third country assessment, this is a very new and very complex process. I would advise um, to seek um, external legal counsel for it. There's also some products available, readily available off the shelf assessments for certain countries. However, again, when you do this, just be mindful that you're doing it in the context of the data processing. So it's not just take it off the shelf and, 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 and use it as I already mentioned. And Finally, as I mentioned, a uh, third step of, of this process is the insurance and assurance of ongoing compliance. And, and in the Schrems to judgment, actually the European Court of Justice really underlined that um, it is the responsibility of the exporters and importers to ensure that the processing of personal data has been and will, will continue to be uh, in compliance with the level of protection granted by the European law. Um, and then it is a requirement to suspend or terminate the transfer if this is not the case. This is then reiterated and confirmed in Article 16 of the, in clause 16 of the standard contractual clauses. So um, as I also, also mentioned, the standard contractual clauses have this section and all of the modules actually have some form of section about documentation and compliance. So especially if you're transferring personal data to a data processor, so your data importer is acting as a data processor, it is, it is a really good idea to take advantage of, of your rights under clause um, 8.9 of module two of the standard contractual clauses and, and, and do your audit rights because this is the best way to ensure actually that your data processors are compliant. A um, really good practical example of, of where this is very helpful is, it, is exactly, um, uh, Ralph talked quite a lot around the, the requirements for access of, of, uh, to data from um, uh, government authorities. So this is a, a place where you can request the access logs and, and, and review if there has actually been such access that you haven't been notified of. Um, so it is, it is a very helpful tool. And also you have to understand that um, again, in relationship to clause 16, it is a huge operational and even financial risk. Imagine if you have a very important vendor. So you're hosting a lot of your, your, your data or your data entire data center is, is hosted, hosted on a cloud service provider. Imagine if it is um, stored in a location which does not provide the relevant level of protection and you have to stop the transfer. This would may have a devastating impact on your business. So that's why this ongoing monitoring and ensuring that the counterparties that you use are compliance, compliant is very, very important. And finally, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll give you a couple of uh, things to think about when you're implementing the new SECs with um, data importer, importers here in Hong Kong and as well as in the region. So as Ralph mentioned um, in variability clauses, um, be mindful of that. I know this is a very common knowledge that, that you should not amend the, most of the clauses in the standard contractual clauses, but in my experience, I have received quite a lot of red line on the SECs. So it is very important to manage your data importer's expectations from the get-go that this is something that cannot be modified and also review just in case if there was any hidden red line to the SECs, just so you don't risk them becoming invalid. Second one is around the obligations on data importers. They're very um, onerous. So you really need to make sure that they can comply. For me, typically it is a red flag if a data importer just accepts the SECs without raising any concerns. Uh, they're very, very robust, um, robust requirements and you need to make sure that they can comply with those requirements. And finally, uh, about the applicable law and jurisdiction, again, as Rolf mentioned, um, you have to choose applicable law and, and forum with it. EU member countries. Be mindful that unlike uh, the UK, uh, most countries within the EU are part of the continental legal system, which is quite different than common law. 
So it is good to get some local council advice as well when, when dealing with both local authorities as well as, as in choosing your, your jurisdiction. Okay, I hope I hope we didn't go too much over time. So pass back to Ada. Thank you.